This scene hurts me. Like, it's funny. Like, I was dying seeing Kazuma and Subaru have finally a conversation together. But just seeing Kazuma say to my boy Subaru, like, you're lucky. You're, you're straight lucky. You harem having man, like, you're lucky. And I'm like, like, from the outsider's perspective, when you're not really looking at what he's went through, like, context, then yeah, Subaru does look lucky. And I think that was just a very great way to handle Kazuma and Subaru explaining themselves and how their life is in their own world. So let's get right into that. Now, the thing that makes it so funny is because when you really think about what, you know, Subaru said about himself that he lives in a mansion, you know, he has a beautiful half-elf around him, he has, you know, beautiful maids, he has this lolly twin-tailed girl that's really powerful, you know, he has this weird cat spirit, you know, he obviously looks like he has been, I guess, given a lot. Like, he's been given, like, gold. And that's what a normal person would see from the outside with no context. And I can understand why someone would come to the wrong conclusion, why Cosmo would say that, because, I mean, when you look at it, he is surrounded by women, beautiful girls, he has his own harem, and it seems like he doesn't really have many struggles because he has the money to be able to, you know, afford to do whatever he wants. He'll never go hungry. And when you look at what Cosma said at the beginning when he was explaining himself, he was basically someone that's always hurting for money, which if you've ever watched Konosuba, that is kind of the case. Like, he could make money, but usually things happen to where they're not able to keep the money or something happens, so just overall... Cosme, yes, his life is a little bit of a struggle just to be able to have things. Now, he does manage to make money here and there, and eventually he does get a mansion in Konosuba. But even then, though, I could see why he'd be a little bit upset with Subaru's story when he finds out that Subaru has just been basically handed everything, which is, like, the main irony of the situation, because one of the big things that Subaru's character does that makes it so amazing for Marie Zero is that he was an MC that thought he was supposed to be handed everything, which is why ReZero just took the community by storm, and it became such a popular Sekai series, is because, once again, Subaru thought he was entitled. He thought he's like, I deserve everything. I am reincarnating the world. I should be given a, you know, a crazy power. I should be given something that allows me to stand out. You know, he thought he was owed everything, and eventually we know what happened. He basically got crushed into the ground and then had a wake-up call to realize that he's nothing. He is a weakling and, you know, he has to work for what, you know, he needs to get, like what he gains. He has to work for it and so that was the big purpose of his story, one of the main fundamental parts of ReZero. So seeing Cosmo saying he's lucky and basically given everything, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. So yeah, um, Let's also talk about the fact that he has no idea that Subaru is someone that, when he dies, obviously, returns back, and it seems like a good power. On, once again, without context, being able to die and come back does seem like a good power. But we all know from watching ReZero that that power, by no means, is necessarily a blessing. It is a curse. And imagine if you were forced to die, like, you know, die repeatedly until you change things, and you have to be traumatized over and over again, basically. That's what Subaru had to go through. Yes, Cosma has died a few times at Konosuba, but nowhere near the level of br brutality that Subaru has had to gone through throughout his own series. So just, uh, a very good moment. It, it's a really good moment of this episode, and I think many are just gonna enjoy it, because there's just so many layers to the Cosma and Subaru conversation, and I, honestly, I've been waiting for it, and I'm glad it finally happened. So let's get right into it. Let's, uh, talk about the other little things. Let's talk about the scene where Cosma and Subaru actually get to start talking together at the beginning of this episode. So, obviously, it's early morning. They're running late. You have Rim grab Subaru and start to run with him. It's a very cute scene. It's a very Rim thing to do. It's all like, oh, that's adorable. But at the same time, Subaru as he is, he doesn't want to seem like that. Like, he, he's prideful. We know this. And the thing is, is he doesn't want to be viewed as someone that's weak. You know, if he really is a man, he wouldn't be having this girl, beautiful woman, pick him up and just dragging him on, you know, her shoulder and taking him to school. He didn't like that. He just felt like his overall pride as a man was being ruined. And then he looks behind him and he sees... This 
this dude, Kazuma, you know, being carried. And he's just all happy and all he's smiling. And he's just like in bliss. And you just see darkness like, why am I having to carry you and all that? Like, this is wrong. Like, shouldn't you have some pride or whatever? He's like, why would my pride be hurt by a woman with a six pack? And I'm like, <laughs> like, dude, I just, I love, I love. I love Cosmo for how much of a scumbag he is. He's just such a fun character. And just seeing the differences, like how they're very similar, but so different in their own way, is why I love that exchange between them. Because when they finally lock eyes on each other, and they both realize that they come from like a, uh, a similar, like, area in their worlds, you're like... Hey, can you put me down, Darkness? Can you put me down, Rim? And that, they had to run to school. It was funny because that was also something they would do. They, in that moment, felt very embarrassed because they most likely were both a Sekai. They both realized it at the time. And having someone from your own world realizing what you're doing is probably going to make fun of you. And so I just love that little exchange. Just the differences in the characters, personalities. It's amazing. Now, um, let's talk about Tanya and Ainz's combo. Now, Tanya and Ainz's combo... It's honestly shocking. I I I'm very shocked by their conversation. The reason why is, is because it's very mature, calm. And honestly, when you think about the characters, Tanya and Ainz, yes, they are adults. I mean, I know Tanya is easily mistaken for a child because she's in a child's body, but we do know from the origin story of Tanya that, that she was a salaryman that was just killed. So she is an adult. She was an adult, a calm, collective adult that was very competent. That's one thing that we know when it comes to Tanya is that she's a very competent individual. And Ainz as well, even though he has his own problems where he fakes it till he makes it in certain areas, he's still very competent. And he's very calm and collective in some areas as well. So seeing those two sit down and actually talk like they did, it makes sense for their characters. But at the same time, it's something that's just so unique with these characters to see something like that. Because we gotta remember... Ainz is a character, like I said, he fakes it till he makes it, and he's always having some weird assumptions or something about something, and leads him to go down paths that are very unexpected. And Tanya as well, she's always thinking being X is doing something, she, you know, constantly ruins conversations because the way she acts her personality, but this was interesting, it was a fascinating, like, look into these two characters, they were to sit down, it would be like the only meaningful conversation that Ainz and Tanya could have to where it wouldn't end in failure, and they can actually be themselves and talk about about their past. So it was a very unique conversation, and I think that was honestly one of my favorite moments of the episode. Yes, the Subaru and Cosmos stuff is amazing, but just the Tanya and Ayn stuff was just so different from what you would expect that honestly, I'm happy for it. I really am. It's uh, a complete diff uh, completely different contrast to what Cosmos and Subaru's was, because it was very chaotic, a lot of chaos, while Ayn's and Tanya's was very calm and collective. But um, anything else really to get into? Hmm... I think not. I think that's pretty much about it when it comes to the episode. It's a good episode, obviously, and I love this series. It, uh, Sekai Quartet is easily one of my favorite series from this anime season just because of how funny it can be and showing things that we're just not used to seeing with these characters. So let me know your thoughts in the comments below, how you felt about this week's episode. Did you enjoy it? Did you hate it? Please be honest in the comments below, and with that, chibi out.